welcome. You have my sword is still on a break, but this week's guest episode is huge. Well, literally, largely because we are talking about dinosaurs. If you are a creationist, leave now. You're gonna hate this. We have Stephen Ray Morris, beloved podcast host and producer, sharing one of his favorite episodes of his podcast called See Jurassic Right, which is an unbelievably entertaining podcast about not only Jurassic Park, but dinosaurs, science, and so much more. Stephen has guests ranging from fossil educators to talent that have touched the Jurassic Park film series. Many of us, including myself, grew up obsessed with both Jurassic Park and dinosaurs in general. When I was a kid, I had these insanely loud, colorful dinosaur bedroom sheets and window treatments um, and was mortally wounded when my mother finally got rid of them. If you know the sheets that I'm talking about, let me know. They were like cartoony dinosaurs in primary colors and I feel like every kid my age had these. If you know what I'm talking about, let me know. If you know, you know. Anyways, See Jurassic Right is a favorite podcast of mine because it really toes the perfect line between education, nostalgia, and comedy. Steven is one of my favorite internet friends. We often bond over swords, Lord of the Rings, the Star Wars extended universe literature, and shit posting on Twitter. Check out his other projects in which he hosts such as Everything But The Movies, A Star Wars Book Club, and The Purr Cast, which is a must for any cat lover. Steven, thank you for all that you do for the podcast universe. You're an incredible host and producer, truly. For those of you that may be interested, Steven is a producer and engineer on some podcasts you may have heard of, such as My Favorite Murder with Karen Kilgariff and Georgia Hardstark, Worst Ever with Christine Lakin and Ala Khaled, Popular Music, the podcast, and Ologies with Allie Ward, which is another favorite podcast of mine, in fact. So kicking off C. Jurassic Rights Back to School series, Stephen interviews vertebrate paleontologist Yara Harity about hadrosaur teeth and paleopathology, which means the disease found in fossils and so much more. So please enjoy this educational episode of See Jurassic Right. One, two, three, four. Filled with odd fright, see Jurassic Right. Bathed in ember light, see Jurassic Right. See Jurassic Right, right, right. See Jurassic Right, right, right. See Jurassic Right, right, right. See Jurassic right, see Jurassic right, see Jurassic Park. It feels appropriate that we are talking about coffee because of my guest today. She is a vertebrate paleontologist. I mean, she she's studying and, and working on so many things, paleopathology, evolution of bone cells. It's Yara Haridi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. This is so exciting. I, I have been following you on Twitter for a bit, and... I mean, I want to talk about Guess the Skull in a little bit, but in, you know, because of this podcast, you know, dinosaurs is, I feel like has been commonly talked about as a sort of like entry point into, to the prehistoric world, into fossils and things like that. Were you a dinosaur kid or what kind of developed your interest in, in fossils in the natural world? Uh, that's such a good question. Um, no, I totally was not a dinosaur kid. Um, so I grew up in the Middle East and I guess for some reason, the, um, like, you know how kids and dinosaurs kind of just go together in North America a lot? Um, it's yeah. not as big of a thing there. Uh, oh, you know, it's not, not all your t-shirts, not all the kids' toys. It's not like boys' toys and, and dinosaurs really go together. It's, I mean, they exist, but they're just not like the go-to. Um, so no, I was never, I was never really a dino kid. I guess what got me interested is because I just love all animals. I always thought animals were cool. I wanted to memorize every animal that ever existed. Uh, my mom would always bring home books and documentaries and stuff that I would just like look at and just look at all these animals that I wouldn't see in day-to-day -day life. And I, that's pretty much what sparked my interest at the beginning, just animals in general. Oh, I love that. I mean, it, 
I I feel like a common thing that I I will like feel sometimes is somebody who grew up liking Pokemon, where then you look at the real world and you're like, yeah, but have you seen an actual giraffe? That's so we are the animals that we kind of have in our daily life are only the, the tip of the iceberg to like mm -hmm. the animals in the like all over the world. I mean, anytime I, you know, talk to somebody from the UK and they like talk about foxes, you know, running around, you're like, what? A fox is just running around in your neighborhood? <laughs> yeah. And, and it's always, you know how like every kid will learn their basic like cheetah, lion, elephant, whatever. When I got into the weird, obscure animals, that's what like started to blow my mind. That like, what the hell is an ant eater? Like weird, weird things that don't make sense. Like like an ant eater is shaped like nothing you would ever see anywhere. Like it's big in the wrong places. It has hooks for hands. It walks on its knuckles like an ape. It makes no sense. And discovering these weird, weird animals like. I make fun of this on Twitter a bunch where I'm like, I'll just see a new animal, usually some weird, weird fish. And I'd be like, oh, that doesn't exist. Like, it can't. It just can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of animals that even just, even the science feels like insane how they were able to. I mean, I was just just watching um, a SciShow video about fishes that like aren't supposed to exist, basically. So that's <laughs> funny that you say that. Yeah, totally. And then... And then I guess it broke my brain when I found out that, you know, everything that doesn't make sense today, now expand that over 400 million years. And there was a lot of that going on. And just like, I'm pretty sure my brain just like melted out of my ears. I'm like, nope, <laughs> I can't, I can't deal. Oh my, there's not just, oh, there's not just these species of animals, but the actual individuals too, as well, over millions of years. And you're just like, I need to lie down now. <laughs> Yeah, that's really well put. It's like after reading a certain about a certain group of animals that just grew horns out of whatever and did sails and did and some of them were aquatic, but some weren't. And it's just like it breaks your brain. You're like, I'm I'm going to go sit down. Well, then as far as as getting into the fossils and getting into bones, like how did that kind of where did that come from? How did that kind of. Oh God, I'm going to say evolve. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have to apologize for any science puns I say to actual no, no, no. scientists. I, I welcome them all. Honestly, though, I welcome them all. Science needs more puns, more people that laugh about it, and less seriousness. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so, this is a funny story. Basically, how I got into paleontology is uh, a series of mistakes. <laughs> or, uh, I mean, happy accidents. Yeah. So... Like I said, I grew up in the Middle East and I'm a child of immigrants and kind of what, you know, a good Arab girl does is she gets a good education and you know what, you're going to, and especially Egyptians, uh, which is where my family's from, we either are pharmacists, like engineers or doctors, and those are your options if you want your parents to actually like, like you. So although my, my mom was very open and very nice. That's still the, the path that I tried to follow. So I was applying for medical school when I wanted to learn more about anatomy. And uh, coincidentally, the only place that I could volunteer uh, that was pretty local to learn more about anatomy was a paleontology lab. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's really weird. But it was, it was um, a, a smaller campus within a larger university in the uh, University of Toronto. And yeah, so the, the lab basically opened their doors to me and they're like, yeah, come sort through our fossils, you know, just see if you like it. And that was the weirdest thing I've ever heard because I, I mean, at that point, I knew fossils were real, but like I had never touched one. I hadn't, I wasn't really like a museum junkie. I wasn't that girl. And it was, it was so confusing. I was like, wait, these are real? Like, this is, this wasn't an actual animal 280 million years ago? Like, <laughs> what? And that's kind of what got me started. Yeah, a series of mistakes, basically. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I, I love that because, I mean, there's, there's something to be really said about discovering things, quote unquote, later. I mean, you know, if you're in school and you're, you know, you're, you know, teens or 20s or something, that's not necessarily later in life, but like, making me sound old, I, too. I think, you know, it, <laughs> well, I just mean like as a, you know, it, like I realized like I was t talking to um, Dustin Grawick and 
it's like, you know, because he became a dinosaur guy, like, you know, in his 30s or whatever. And it's just like, well, my, my dinosaur knowledge is because I, you know, grew up with it is like based on like the early 90s, which is so behind, you know, I, and and I realize I've just been catching up a lot. But if you're getting into things, you know, as, when you're already an adult like that, to me, sounds so exciting because it's you you're equipped to ask like the really big questions right away, I feel like. Yeah, or get schooled by an eight year old, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> happens all the time. Wait, so OK, so that makes me before we get into some of your work that um, I, I feel like this relates to like, how did you start? And I'm going to probably mispronounce this as well, too. But how did you start working with the Museum for Natur Kun? Nertekunde is that is that German for like Natural History Museum it's, of Berlin? It's, yeah, it's it's Museum for Naturkund. I, I probably butcher that too, and everyone's gonna be like, "What are you doing?" Anyway, um, <laughs> so I, I got I'm basically doing my PhD here, so I got a funded position to basically come here and do the project that I'm doing. So it's it's more like who I wanted to work with and the project that I I thought was interesting. Um, that basically led me all the way to Berlin from Toronto. When you're choosing what to study, what to work on, you are, is it basically like what comes first, I guess, is that like a chicken and the egg situation where it's like, <laughs> I want to study this thing or do I want to work with this person? What are they doing? Is it relating to what I want to do? How does that work? Right. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I glossed over that. I, I, re I remember how, um, opaque basically the system was when I was outside of it because you really don't know how does that scientist end up there or why are they studying what they're studying and people think that there's this magical like stepwise program and what I tell them is literally it's a bunch of like small it's like the butterfly effect it's like all these little choices you make end up compounding into the direction you go into so for example like I said um, I volunteered at this um, lab in University of Toronto, and because I did decent volunteer work, they offered me a master's there. So I did my master's and ended up working on teeth. I literally only worked on teeth because someone else there worked on teeth. And once I got interested in teeth and the evolution of teeth, I got interested in the evolution of tissues. And from there, it kind of cascades into one topic into the other. And that's what I really love about paleontology specifically, is that you can kind of choose what angle you want to go at. If you're more of a chemistry person, you can choose the chemistry side. If you're a bone person, you can choose the bone side. If you're an ecology person, if you are almost any kind of direction can be applied to deep time, which is like the magic of paleontology. It's that idea of like, you know, you're fascinated, like, especially if you grew up being like a kid interested in this stuff, and then all of a sudden you're like, well, how do I do it? And it's, it's kind of cool to see that there's a flexibility there on some level. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I get that question all the time, right? I mean, now that I'm more on social media and I'm more accessible to people who are interested, a lot of people will basically ask me exactly that. Hey, I'm so-and-so and I enjoy you know, deep time in history or dinosaurs, or sometimes they're very specific. Like, I really like hadrosaur feet. I had this one person who was like, I really <laughs> like hadrosaur feet. I'm like, where's this going? But like, they actually <laughs> enjoy the biomechanics of it. And then they start asking me questions. I'm like, oh, well, this is great. You know, you know, already you're like 20 steps ahead of where I was. So there's a lot of networking that you kind of have to do to get your foot in the lab. But also, there's a lot of flexibility after that, which is great. So in that sense, when you're working with the museum, are you actually interacting with because it seems like you do talks and things like that and stuff like what is how has that been is is like, I guess you would call that the science communication part of it. How how is that for you? Um, if um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I like to talk and I like the sound of my own voice. So I kind of like foisted that on the on any program that I'm in. So I basically always ask like, oh, is there presentations to be done? Is there, if there's ever a speaking competition, if there's ever uh, a chance for any of that stuff, I'm like the first to volunteer to basically y just yammer on about bones or fossils <laughs> or whatever. So um, luckily my museum was starting this new experimental um, idea, which is basically they refurbished a whole wing of the museum to be an open area with just a bunch of tables and seating and 
all that. And they kind of gave it to the scientists. They're like, do whatever you want to do with it. And I'm like, you guys sure? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, go. And so I just filled a bunch of drawers with skulls and would just like walk around showing people skulls, which is hilarious when you don't speak the language. And everyone that comes to the museum is usually not even German. So like I got a bunch of Russian and Czech. And so I had to find a way to be a science communicator without the language, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So I kind of push, I push my own agenda wherever I end up is basically what it is. I, I want to talk about science uh, because I wish someone had introduced it to me earlier. Some of my like best childhood memories are getting to go to a natural history museum, the one in Los Angeles specifically for me. When you're in the museum and you know people are walking around, what are the kind of questions that people are asking you typically? So... I guess it depends if it's like kids or adults, um, but a lot Who of the, the better questions, <laughs> kids, always kids. Um, most adults ask me if, um, so we have these massive, um, sauropod, the long neck dinosaur, um, like, uh, what's it called? Skeletons in the, in the main hall, in our main dinosaur hall, we have a bunch of them from, uh, the Tendaguru. Uh, locality. So some of the, the biggest mount of a sauropod is actually in our museum. And I get like, wow. I get to see him every morning and I'm like, hi, Fred. Um, uh. But almost every adult asks me if it's real or if what? they, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know why, even though there's like signs everywhere, which show you, you know, um, what parts are casts and what parts are real fossils. But yeah, so there's a bunch of fossils everywhere, and, I, and people always ask me, "Are these real?" And I'm like, "Yeah, these, like this is what, how you can tell if fossils real. You you can see what casts, you know, which ones are casts. Especially our museum like makes a point of um, making the casts very smooth and not textured, so you can really tell, like, oh yeah, that's the real rib, and the rib beside it isn't real because it was broken or too fragile or whatever. So those are some really weird questions that I get. Yeah. I didn't realize that the the idea that some of the bones aren't real or cast was like a big deal. So okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a step back before I answer the the actual paleo community part. But I always feel like kids see the bigger picture in a way. You know, like they see the whole skeleton. They don't really want like care if that one toe is not real. Like they just know that the animal existed and they accept it for the magic it is. While like. I don't know if adults are dead inside or like something happens to us along <laughs> the way, but like we're really picking apart the amazing stuff. So like when, when I show them a weird skull of a weird animal that does like crazy things, they're always asking like, yeah, but how do we know that? But which is fine, which is fine. Cause like it actually gives me a chance to talk about the science, but at the same time you feel like they're missing out on that like spark. You know, mm. I don't know how else to describe it, but like kids, like they stare at a big skeleton and they're like, whoa, this thing lived here and walked on the same ground and they freak out and they feel it in their hearts. And, and adults, they've just like, I feel like they've missed a part of that. I don't know what it is. People don't like when you like you talk about like all the emotional stuff, but it's so true. It's such a big <laughs> part of the experience of museums. Like it's important. Oh, totally. I mean. Yeah, this is somebody who cries about dinosaurs sometimes. So you're you're, you're speaking. We're we're on. We're we're both speaking the same language. So Perfect. yeah, it's amazing. What was your purest question about? Casts oh, well, and yeah, stuff? I guess I guess is that something that's been developing over time? Like this idea that there needs to be a more transparency towards distinguishing between real bones and and casts or whatever the correct term or not casts, but like. No, cast is right. Yeah, yeah. Stand in. <laughs> sure. Any, any of the above. I wouldn't say it's new, honestly. I mean, I don't know if you've been to Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. Uh, that big no, wall that you need to go. I will take you there. Uh, and if you end up going, yes, let me please. know. I will let you know. Talk to the paleontologist there. She's awesome. Anyway, um, that's a really old monument. And it's been up for a long time. And people have been showing, like, so there's there's a bunch of little displays on the side and they'll tell you straight up like on the labels which ones are cast and which ones are not uh and those are really old displays so i don't think it's a new thing i think now that it's getting a little bit more attention because some people are using like 
you know, the whole young earth people are like using that as a talking point. They're like, oh, well, you know, yeah, I, I don't know if you're aware of this. So like a lot of people will say, oh, you know, all the fossils and stuff are cast they're none of them are real and this is like it's all being faked and blah blah, blah. the earth is oh, no. six thousand years old anyway i can't even imagine as a scientist i mean it's not like there are podcast deniers do you know what i mean like, <laughs> uh... yeah it's, it's funny because you really have to be careful depending on where you are right because for example a lot of times um as a science communicator i know that sometimes the best way to talk to someone through something like for example like even a young earth creationist person you have to avoid the stickler topics so like you're not going to talk to them about religion you're not going to talk to them about the exact date of the world what i'm going to do is give them a suite of facts um that they kind of have to answer themselves and then you kind of talk through that because in the end, facts are not going to make someone go against their upbringing and emotions and all that. And we have to live with people that have different ideas. Uh, as frustrating as it can be, <laughs> as... as you can't as just a, mute them, like, on Twitter? You can't just block <laughs> them, like, on Twitter? I mean, you know, I... Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. That, that internal scream gets louder and louder. It really does. Um, but, yeah, I mean, at the same time, so like my, a lot of my family, um, especially back in Egypt, just be, just because of lack of exposure and the increased exposure of religion, they ask me the same thing. They ask me, um, are those fossils even real? How do you know how old dinosaurs are? How do you know you're not just making it up? So it definitely takes a whole lot out of me <laughs> to not scream oh, sure. at that moment. Um, <laughs> but, but it's important. I mean, honestly, if anything, that's the most important science communication out there. I mean, I can spout about, you know, skull facts all day, but when you can bring something new into someone's worldview, that's the real impact. Huh. Sorry for ranting. That's no, that's really <laughs> No, no, that's actually very beautiful to think about. And it it is almost maybe we're I mean, I I don't know if we're being too harsh, but truly the existential nature of I mean, if you had to flip your entire worldview that probably is pretty rough for some people yeah. or, or you know the human nature to sort of cling to things that are comfortable or safe and then you're telling me that the earth has been around for billions of years it's scary you know, you just exactly like spin out of control i mean to me it's it's uh that's the kind of shit that makes me feel alive personally but yeah. but it's also like even for you for someone who's lived with that knowledge isn't it sometimes overwhelming like just if you look at if you look at a picture of space or like a beautiful like nebula that like has been exposed like the picture's been on exposure for like a long time you see all the beautiful colors and you're like wow we are nothing <laughs> to me it's beautiful but it's also scary yeah it's scary it's it's comforting it's i i like the word sublime a lot for those mm -hmm. kind of feelings mm -hmm. Again, I feel like in a lot of my conversations, because I've been doing them all up here while I'm in Oregon, where I can actually see the stars and you see the Milky Way. And I like have this like um, like the pit of my stomach drops almost kind of to just kind of see that and be like, whoa, you know, like we're, whole, you know, we're just a tiny speck in this whole thing. Mm hmm. <laughs> okay now now i now i want to pass out but um <laughs> but before i do but before i do that out of, out of out of pure joy but i know we talked briefly about because just this is probably the most timely thing i wanted to bring up but uh you know the pandemic and everything and all that you know it's the stuff with museums right now is really bumming me out and i really want to try and find a way to i don't know i don't know what to do but what was i just wanted to ask what was it like when you got to go back to the museum were you like was it like seeing old friends were you like hey guys how you been you know like what, what's it been like hanging out here you know all by yourself for a few months you know what's funny this is actually the best time to bring that up because it literally felt it it first of all obviously it was sad because i was given permission to go back um before some other people were because my lab is isolated so i'm allowed to actually go and work in my lab and not be in contact with people uh, but i get to walk by the fossils and stuff in the morning and so you know how you talked about that like feeling of seeing a galaxy or seeing the milky way and knowing that like you love it so much but it just exists like that's kind of what that skeleton like seeing those skeletons was like i'm like hey what's up and 
and then I realized they've been here forever. <laughs> like not just at this museum, but like on Earth, they've been here forever. Like I'm this speck that like flicked, like floats back and forth to them. Time is is different, and it was it was really. It was good because it was contextual. You know, after a while, we lose track of time, especially in this pandemic. Like, what is a Tuesday? What is morning? What is, you know, like what the, the days I've been counting them based on how many different pants have changed. Like, we just lose track of time. But it kind of made me feel like it was okay to waste several weeks because several weeks mean nothing in deep time. So it was really yeah. nice, comforting that way. Let's let's talk about guess the skull. I want to. I, I feel like there's since since I started following you and and a bunch of other scientists who have games and play the games. You know, find that lizard, crow or no. Like mm -hmm. I feel like my Twitter timeline has just my just <laughs> that website has just gotten. Yes, I think you guys are and you're just bringing so much joy to my life. And Aww. and if anybody has any sort of I don't know, not doubts, but just, it's just like, no, this is, yeah, learning is fun. I, I guess that's the cheesy, it's, I'm just getting to the, to that cheesy statement, but um, how did Guess the Skull get started? How did you, how did, when did you decide to do that? That's, that's a good question. Um, so I guess as a hashtag, it, it got started maybe, uh, actually, I, I just checked, hold on. I think it got started last year, July or something like that. Um, but basically it's been a game that like my partner and I would play all the time, which is because I would, because I'm a paleontologist and when you're trying to figure out why an extinct animal is doing an extinct thing, you're going to compare it to all these modern animals. So I end up literally just Googling a bunch of, you know, shrew skull. What do shrews do? Cause I think this animal digs. So what does a shrew skull look like? And you start looking at these and you're like, wait, that's what that animal skull is like. And I'm like <laughs> teaching myself as, as I'm learning, I'm teaching myself. Then I would like pass it to my partner and be like, what animal do you think this is? And so he would guess whatever he thought it was. And, and then we kind of just get in one of these wars where we try to outdo each other with weird animals that we have no <laughs> idea what they are because I mean, we see these, especially with mammals, like they're these cute, fuzzy, big eyed, like adorable things with monster bones underneath and nobody gets to see them. <laughs> so that's some of my favorite stuff. And then um, as someone who, again, does a lot of comparative anatomy, so I, I'm, I'm always looking for modern animals that we kind of know what they do today. So we can compare them to animals which we have no idea what they're doing. So I spent a lot of time in... Um, in modern collections. So in, in our museum here in Berlin, uh, I spent a lot of time in the mammal collections, even though I don't specifically study mammals, but it's because they're so well known. So I will always take a friend with me or something and I'll pick up a weird skull and be like, okay, I'll hide the tag. and be like, what do you think this thing is? <laughs> and so that's kind of how it started. Even on Twitter, I took that picture and we had so much fun playing that game in the collection. I just posted the picture and I was like, Guys, if you had to guess what this animal was, what is it? And it was like some weird domestic pig breed with like a stub nose and just a freak face. Um, <laughs> but it was awesome. And from that, I realized I'm like, oh, people love this. And like, it's not just me that loves this. And then you get to talk about the animal and you get to talk to people about how they come to the conclusions they come to and why. And I love people's comments. They're like, oh, I'm looking at the teeth. That doesn't look like this kind of animal's teeth. Blah, blah. And you can see them working through it. And that's my absolute favorite. Because while people think it's just a fun game, this is literally like a paleontologist's job. Like we literally just look at bones and we try to come to conclusions why the bone is shaped that way. Oh, wow. And I think like paleo art is, is really doing a... Uh, a pretty good job nowadays like i'm seeing all these chunky chunky animals people are adding more fat more meat and i love it because when i did dissections in um in undergrad and when i taught how to do comparative anatomy i dissected a lot of animals and to get to the bones which is like my favorite part but i'm biased you have to go through a lot of meat and oh. <laughs> and realistically you have to add a ton of meat to these animals, because that's what's moving them. That's what's keeping them warm. Yeah, I think Kelly Ward is doing a great job nowadays. You see all these chunky animals. <laughs> the thicker, the better. Um, Amen. 
Well, uh, on that note about Twitter, the thing I've asked everybody uh, and I'm asking everybody is that, um, again, I discovered your work through Twitter. And I guess to the biggest question for me relating to that, does being on there help your actual like work day to day or is it just more of a tool for science communication? I think it's somewhere um, in between. So it definitely like I wouldn't say it's a day to day help, although now I know that there are some scientists that it's way easier to come in contact with them through Twitter than through email. So I'll be like, oh, you didn't reply to my email. In general, too, it's really good to like just put out the call. Like I'm looking for, does anyone know about this paper? I'm looking for an answer to this. Uh, I need a new method. It's, it's an amazing resource. You literally have thousands of people at your fingertips. And for the most part, although I know there are some dark sides of Twitter, like for the most part, it's been an overwhelmingly positive experience. People are so good and they want to share their cool science. And if anything, it's really not helping my like fragmentary interests. Like I'm interested in everything, right? Like, oh, bones, oh, sharks, oh, things that like are squiggly and squishy, like everything. I'm so interested in everything. And it's, it's filling that like need in me to study all these weird, obscure animals. I, I think it's great. And uh, I hope more people get indoctrinated into science Twitter, honestly. <laughs> I love it. Well, I mean, speaking on on that note, um, yeah, you you uh, I've seen that you you've mentioned that you're studying the evolution of bone cells. If I I guess we're not we're not going to we're not going to parties right now, but <laughs> if if you had to explain uh, what you're studying related to the evolution of bone cells at a party, what's your like fun My elevator cocktail? Pitch. Yeah, yeah. So usually I'll ask people first, and and foremost is like, okay, have you ever broken a bone? So Stephen, you can answer. Uh, I've never broken a bone. Okay. So people who... <laughs> that's fine. No, I mean, no, yes, you, you ruined this for me. You ruined this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I've broken all my bones. I, uh, I, it was a horrible tennis accident. I don't know how it happened. The ball bounced off the walls and... And broke every yeah. single bone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So even... Let's say you haven't broken a bone. You've grown, right? So your bones are not the same length or width or heaviness or density as you were when you were a kid. You are clearly not the same height. You've changed it a lot since you've basically been a child. So our bones are not these like dead inanimate objects. They continue to grow and change. And all of this growth and change is actually mediated or governed by these little cells that live inside your bone. Now, these cells are called osteocytes, and that's what bone cells are. Um, but the idea is that actually a lot of vertebrates have them. Dinosaurs had them, ancient fish had them, modern birds have them. Most animals that we know of today um, have them, except our very, very, very early bony, fishy, fishy ancestors that like lack jaws about 400 and 100 million years ago, we started bones without cells. So, wow. so the question is basically, if today everything our bones do, we think they do because of these cells, well, how did these early fish do it? And why were they fine and, you know, ruling the seas for so long? Um, so that's some of the questions I'm asking, basically, which is, what are the benefits of these bone cells? Because they take a lot of energy to maintain hundreds of thousands of bone cells in every little square inch of bone you have. You have several hundreds of thousands of cells just taking care of your bones. So they're quite expensive for your body to keep up. So they must be <laughs> useful. So that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out. How useful are they really? And just to throw a wrench in the whole story, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but basically I always like um, make fun of fish because they're confusing and they like to do things <laughs> different. Uh, but there's a bunch of modern fish today that have decided, oh, bone cells, pshaw, pshaw, and they just toss them right out. And they went basically without bone cells. And so that's super interesting. And it's another reason I, I look at fish a lot to kind of figure out, okay, what can they do that we can't and why are they doing it the way that they're doing it so that's kind of what i'm trying to oh, figure wow. out oh interesting gosh freaking fish <laughs> freaking 
fucking uh, fish. Uh, yeah, because I was going to ask, Is I forgot, is coelacanth a bony fish? So, coelacanth, so we have coelacanths today. They are a bony fish. They have reduced a bunch of their skeleton to um, basically because they live in the deep and they don't really care. And they're doing a bunch of things things with oil and other things because they're fish and ugh. Uh, so they've reduced a bunch of their skeleton, but they are technically bony fish. This is another thing fish do to just make me like want to kill them a little bit. It's like, yeah, you're a bony fish, but I don't want bone anymore. And they just toss it all out and you're like, ugh. The ocean is, a, is to me, uh, the ocean is a lot scarier than outer space. I'm like, t- throw me to space all day. And I, I love the ocean, but man, the deep sea, I don't know what's going on down there. <laughs> You know what's funny? We don't either. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen, um, what is it called? There's a whole channel on on YouTube where it's like they just send these like deep sea submarines and there's these um, marine biologists who do voiceovers and they're all screaming all the time. It's hilarious because they're like, wait, oh gosh, what is that? I have to see that. I will send you a link. It's amazing. We can like post it or something, but it's amazing. They're literally freaking out all the time and like they're second guessing what this creature is because... It's just aliens. It's just aliens down there, Stephen. It's just aliens. It's not okay. <laughs> I, but uh, back to your, you know, back to your work and stuff like that. You're also mm-hmm. interested in paleopathology. Would you consider yourself a paleopathologist? Sure. There's, I mean, there's like seven of us, so sure, why not? Yeah, yeah. it's it's quite a small field, but yeah, it's totally one of my um, one of my many interests. It, again, it's that moment of like taking things for granted. And I think as you know, somebody who's interested in science as we like, you know, try to dive deeper. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> water joke. Um, but you know, as we try to get into this more and like, look at the layers and everything like that, the idea that you're studying diseases on fossils is like, what, how, how does that even work? How are, how do you know that something is like, um, you know, an effect from a disease? Are you looking at modern, the like effect of diseases on bones and then kind of working your way back? Like, how does that all come together? I mean, that's a great question. Uh, it's basically a made up field. Uh, where we all just look at uh, bumpy, lumpy bones, and we're like, what the heck happened to that animal? And then from that, exactly what you said, we we work backwards from, because of course we're super biased, right? We're, we only get diseases that affect a bone, right? I mean, most animals, most dinosaurs, most ancient animals that had diseases, they probably had it in their soft tissue, they had it in things that just don't preserve. However, with things that do affect a bone and do preserve and have made it all the way through time onto our table, at that point, I feel like it's almost like our job. Like, it's looking at you. It's like, you got to figure this out. Like, what happened? And a lot of times, it's actually super easy to tell uh, what happened. So, for example, sometimes, especially with, like, theropods. Stephen, I want you to, like, take a look at every skeletal mount that you see from now on with a different set of eyes okay every time you see a theropod any meat-eating dinosaur look at their ribs their ribs are always messed up they have some weird bumps and lumps um they also have a bunch of vertebral things so look at their backbones they usually have some fused or broken or just look at the shape you can some some things are quite obvious like broken ribs super obvious um <clears throat> i think it's at the lacm that they have uh, a theropod cast with several broken ribs in a row like that thing either tumbled off a cliff or got like rammed on the side oh and it's it's amazing And that's what I really like about paleopathology. It's not only like, I mean, obviously I'm a bone nerd, so I I want to look at what the cells were doing and, you know, oh, how could it heal and what animals healed in different ways. But realistically, what most people want to know is how did that animal get hurt or how did that weird bone pathology actually, how can it tell us about their behavior? And it can tell us quite a bit, which... I think it's kind of cool because it's like a snapshot of how they used to walk or how they would use their tails or for example um ceratopsians the the horned dinosaurs they often have 
like weird fused neck vertebrae and they can be crush injuries so maybe they actually were ramming into each other some people found frill injuries so maybe they really were like aiming for each other's frills or maybe it was a theropod that went after the frills or something like that so i mean they really lead to full fleshed out stories of how this animal you know had this pathology and survived it because everything we find today is something that they've survived because a fresh pathology like a break or an injured frill or something like that if it just broke and then the animal died right after it would just look like a broken fossil it wouldn't look like a pathology so they actually have to have been injured and then survived it so like we're looking at survivors oh wow i didn't think of it that way before that's really cool mm -hmm. um yeah, everyone look. It just everyone's got is so messed up, man. It looks rough sometimes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, like the bigger ones, the yeah, big theropods. For some reason, they just just gnarly, just messed up animals. <laughs> really, especially the skulls. They're just bumpy and lumpy all over. Ugh. What are some of the like gnarliest examples you've seen? So I'm gonna use some famous examples that maybe the listeners will know. So for example, for anyone who knows Sue, Sue the big um, T-Rex, she has, um, or they have, some um, fused, really messed up, I think it was a tibia, so the lower leg bone, has a big lump that has confused a bunch of us for a long time because it hasn't really gotten scanned properly, so we don't know if it's an injury or a disease or, or a disease after an injury. But also a lot of older T-Rexes, if you know, if wherever you go uh, in any of your museums, you look at them, they have these holes in their jaw. And these holes in their jaw are not actually normal, so the juveniles don't have that. They develop them as they get older. Or oh. another theory is that, um, that they have this pathology that modern vultures have, which is something to do with uh, a certain, I think it's, I think it's a protist, basically this unicellular organism. Uh, that lives in water and causes this disease that basically causes these cysts in the jaw and whatever. And modern birds have it, so people think that maybe these um, tyrannosaurids had it too as they got older. We don't really know, uh, but it's these weird development, like only the older ones have it, so it's very strange. Uh, and they're really obvious, so any, any mount of any older tyrannosaur you see and it has these holes in the jaw, those are not normal. Oh, wow. Interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. it's to me, like some of my favorite paleo art is, you know, the the kind that like stirred the imagination growing up is not necessarily like violent or anything, but just just showing, you know, that these animals aren't just standing like these animals that you're, you know, in the past aren't just standing still being like, sup, dudes, like it's, <laughs> no, they were they had these things that affected them in their daily lives like that. Yeah, totally. And like, I don't know. I, I mean, especially if there is some evidence towards it, like a lot of, a lot, uh, some quite a bit of dinosaurs. Um, I think it's fine to show that these animals were prey and predator, and and there was some violence that happens. I mean, when you look, watch a documentary with lions and wildebeests, they're not hugging each other. Like they're not just chilling, being like, "Yo, what up." Like it's not that's not just that's just not the way it is. And well, yeah, murder it's a murder hug, if anything. <laughs> murder hug. <laughs> my cat murder hugs my ankles all the time. Yeah. So when you're looking at the bones, are you are you trying to actually name a specific disease or is it more just like that like like the example of Sue that you're almost just trying to kind of see what the most like the closest related thing to it is uh that's a good question so basically what we're trying to find out is when we have like a weird pathological bone we try to figure out if it's a trauma so if it's something that happened you know because of an injury or if it's some sort of systemic disease like an infection because of whatever uh, and then when we narrow it into either category we can try to narrow it down even further <clears throat> depending on the kind of disease is it like a disease you're born with or is it a disease you get because of old age like arthritis um or something like that so basically we try to narrow it down as much as possible but like realistically you're not going to get a diagnosis that's like a hundred percent because most modern diagnoses are based on um like cellular cultures so you know you'll take a 
a swab or something like that to actually make sure it's an infection. Or if it's arthritis, then you know you actually check the immune response and stuff like that, which is something that we obviously can't do with fossils. So yeah, we just try to narrow it down as much as possible. It, yeah, it feels like you're a detective almost. It totally is. But I mean, I think that's most of paleontology, right? You're getting this scrambled up bone bed and you're trying to figure out who these animals were, what they were doing, you know, everything, basically as much about their life as possible. And I think uh, paleopathology kind of just brings another level to that where you're actually looking at them almost like a modern day doctor kind of looking and trying to diagnose your patients. Although as like huh. a lot of my family members will say like, well, it's too late for you to do anything for them anyway. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. You're like, look, I am sort of a doctor. I'm a, <laughs> You know, but just of the prehistoric animals, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. My uncle is like, uh, I love him to death, but he's like, you know, if you're not giving injections, you're not a real doctor. Like, I'm like, fine, what? fine. <laughs> so I was telling him about like. <laughs> that's an interesting metric about what is a doctor. <laughs> that's so that's the baseline. <laughs> that's the baseline. <laughs> Which is funny. I was telling him about, um, yeah, we found cancer in a, in a fossil, in a Triassic fossil. So it was like this ancient little turtle that had like bone cancer. And I was telling him how this was a cool big find and blah, blah, blah. He's like, but can you give an injection? I'm like, no, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was just joking. Don't worry. What is the weirdest like tooth fact that you've like learned or, or you've discovered, uh, cause we didn't get to talk about teeth much at all, but I know <laughs> that was something you, that, that is what you, you know, started with and stuff mm -hmm. like that. What, like, what is it about teeth or what is like an interesting fact that you've learned studying, uh, fossilized teeth? A good tooth fact. Let me think, let me think. Or a favorite tooth. I guess my, well, I mean, my favorite teeth have to be, it's a tie between hadrosaurs and sharks. It really is. I just like a lot of teeth. I'm a girl who likes a lot of teeth. It's just, that's the way I am. With, with sharks, obviously, they continuously replace their teeth. They always have several rows ready to go. And a lot of people don't know that hadrosaurs are the same way, except instead of like the several rows that are ready horizontally, they're all vertically. And they use several teeth at the same time. And they make these like massive dental batteries, this brick of teeth that they chew with and when i discovered like when i learned about that i didn't discover it um it basically blew my mind because why do you need so many teeth <laughs> when like a cow just lives chewing with its same permanent um set of teeth and that kind of blew my mind and uh, hadrosaurs are super cool sharks are super cool um and yeah much tooth replacement is like Definitely the way to go. More teeth, the better. I mean, mammal teeth, they ha they're, they're so good when they fit right. That's the thing. But then sometimes they just start <laughs> growing in weird places. Oh, extra tooth fact. Some weird, and this ties into pathology, if you'll let me. Um, yes, of course. Basically, sometimes if you have a tumor, even if it's not cancerous, that gets confused, it'll sometimes start to make teeth. So there's a guy who has a, t like, uh, grew a tooth on the bottom of his foot. What? On his foot? <laughs> yeah. You're a no. You're a no. Please. Oh, no. Chew as you step. I don't know. Uh, I don't oh. know. Can we get that on a bumper sticker? Or <laughs> Chew as right. you step or, or feet teeth. On a t-shirt. Feet teeth. Feet teeth. Oh. oh. Look, it's almost Halloween season, so this is perfect. This it's all, is it's going, always going directly, Halloween season. Yeah, it's connecting. Um, uh, I'm so sorry. Feet teeth. Now I can't think of anything else. Um, wait, did I hear your frogs? Did I hear your frogs a second ago? I think you might have. Yeah, so I have this box of frogs that's just chilling. I mean, it's not a box. It's a full uh, terrarium here. <laughs> just a just an Amazon <laughs> box that just has a couple of frogs in it just hanging out. That's normal. Uh, I thought everyone had one of those. Um, no, it's just a, it's a terrarium full of um, these rusty tree frogs. And I kept the light on so we could record relatively quietly, but they know it's like their breeding season, end of summer. It's rainy season. It's time to do it. So... Yeah, that must have been what you heard. A couple of bops, right? I go back and forth about wanting to get a fish tank, but... Um, fish are too much work. I just... Yeah, I don't know. But I just... I don't know. I just love... I love animals. I mean, this is just going all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. Mm -hmm. Just having 
animals around i mean is that something for you too that like obviously you study fossils and and you know and bones and stuff but like is there something about also being surrounded by you know living animals also that you love or look i don't know how to tell you this but like my poor immigrant mother i kept like i think I, at my peak i had like seven or eight lizards in our basement and she like doesn't touch lizards like, but I made her come around to it because I just would, I like, rescue all these geckos that nobody wanted anymore. I love animals and I love keeping them for so long. And I've tried to avoid it now that I'm in grad school and I'm, I'm traveling a lot. So in Berlin, it's, it's really difficult because I, I used to travel when, you know, in the before times. Uh, I used to travel every couple months. So it got easier to just keep plants. And I think uh, now I have, like, 74 species of plants in my apartment in my tiny tiny apartment <laughs> yeah being surrounded by life honestly is probably the best antidepressant there is there was this hotel i went to in san francisco where they had like vines like wrapping all through the hallways and stuff too and i was just like there's something so peaceful and like like good vibes i don't know maybe it's the plants we're meant to live under trees not under roofs i don't know i feel that like our eyes like just need to see green to be like okay we're not dead like <laughs> i just i just think you should surround yourself with plants that's that's some good advice mm -hmm. um and then speaking of advice to tie into mm -hmm. what i really mm -hmm. wanted to tie into very good segue what advice would yeah i know i'm always trying to make the perfect segue <laughs> but then if i call it out then is it the perfect segue i don't know but what advice would you give someone who wants to get uh, into paleontology or science communication in 2020 and kind of what challenges do they face would they face might they face look it's a tough time that we're living through for everything but honestly like when it comes to science communication i think double double triple and quadruple check your facts even i get some things wrong every now and again but double check, but don't let that like dampen your enthusiasm because there's been nothing better. Like, I think the only reason I've been this successful this far is because I'm loud and excited. It's like, <laughs> that's the best way to serve up science is on a cracker of enthusiasm. Like, how about that? Um, so that's I a t-shirt right there. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. But um, but yeah, like keep keep being like honestly, science communication. Now you can do it in so many ways. You can do it on TikTok. You can do it on Twitter. You can do it by just literally getting out in the street and having like a couple of weird specimens or a weird shirt or a sign. You do it wherever you want to do it. Um, however, when it comes to actually getting paid for it and like making it a career, it's a little bit more difficult, and you have to kind of like build up your base so i would suggest doing that you know do what you are comfortable with uh keep sharing what you're excited about because that's super infectious and that's the point of all of this and then from that you can use that as a way to build up your base and use that to apply for things like being a tour guide at a museum or whatever and you can start from there for science communication if that's what you want as for paleontology um, unfortunately, depending on how high you want to go with paleontology, you kind of need some sort of professional degree. Although some people now, you know, you can, you can be a paleontologist with just a bachelor's or whatever, as long as you know the right people. And I suggest, you know what, just reach out to people when you're interested in something. Read a lot, obviously. Stay interested in what you're interested in because that's what's going to drive you through the harder days. Um, don't force yourself to branch out into something that you think is more popular but you don't love because the people in that subfield that love it will always outshine you because they love it. So stay with what you love and it'll work out if you just keep going for it and reaching out and make the connections and keep learning. I think that's the best advice I have for paleo. I feel like I'm not equipped to give paleo advice, but I've gotten here. So <laughs> if you want to get to here, exactly. <laughs> this is how you do it. I think even if you're good at the thing that you're not passionate about, when a dark day comes, you know, it's going to be hard for you to push yourself out of it because on the other end is something that you're not passionate about. But if it's something you're passionate about, 
you can at least push yourself through on, to the other side to say, okay, at least I can get back to blah, blah, which is something that you actually appreciate. I think that's the big difference. It's like, it's easier to get back up if it's for something you care about. Yeah, no, that's very true. I like that. Well, again, this has been so amazing and I'm so glad that we finally got to chat. I The last question I have is, because again, you mentioned on your website that you love coffee <laughs> and have you... And I, again, I probably drank in like four cups before we talked this morning because <laughs> I have these ginormous soup cups. Uh, has there been something that, you know, you're on that extra, you're on that maybe third or fourth cup of the night and you're working on something? Has there, have you ever, have you ever made that connection of like, have you just dis- like, what's the biggest discovery you've made while in coffee? So, I mean, I, I credit all of my discoveries ever to coffee, all of them, every single one. Because I am super non-functional without coffee. But if we're going to be specific, um, I'm I'm not someone who can really work at night. So like once it's like past six or something, unless someone's with me, I really don't work. So I really love coffee breaks with coworkers. So during my master's, I would always like go on coffee breaks with senior students and stuff. And, and I would bounce ideas back and forth. And I think I figured out basically my last chapter to my master's and figuring out how these Permian reptiles replace their teeth as I uh, as I was having coffee with a senior student at the end there. But in general, honestly, coffee, I think, powers all of science today. I mean, <laughs> if I had coffee in the field, like, I, I need to have coffee in the field. So, like, if someone's asked me to go do field work, I'm like, okay, but coffee, though... And they're like, yeah, there'll be coffee in the morning. I'm like, and in the afternoon, they're like, yeah, there's a thermos. Perfect. Done. Let's go. <laughs> can you hear them? Oh, yeah, I can hear them. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they're making sweet, sweet love, or at least trying to, maybe. <laughs> they're trying to find each other, yeah. Yara, this has been so wonderful. I'm so glad. I, I feel like I learned a lot, and it was so great chatting with you. Oh, thanks, Stephen. It's been great talking to you, too. Where can people find you? Where can people follow your work? When does Guess the Skull happen? How do they get involved, you know, can play along with that and everything? So Guess the Skull is every week, usually on Wednesday, but sometimes if the inspiration strikes me or if I see a cool skull, I'll post an extra one during the week. And I let it run for about 24 hours so everyone from every time zone can play and just put your guess in and then I reveal it the next day. Uh, you can find that on Twitter and Instagram at Yara underscore Haridi. Uh, same handle for both platforms. Uh, I would also suggest people to check out my website, The Bare Bones. I will be updating uh, more blogs and stuff uh, once the pandemic has chilled out a little bit about what it's like to be a grad student, how you can get to basically this kind of try to figure out uh, how to explain to people the path uh, and talk about bones and fun, weird stuff. So that's where you can find me and feel free to message me with any questions about bones, paleontology or fossils. Awesome. Well, we'll let the frogs play us out. (laughs) Um, Thank you so much, Yara. This has been awesome. No problem. Nebula.